My Kids Hate Their Desks and What I Did About It, Episode 468. The 10 Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Today, we're talking with 15 year veteran teacher Brooke Markle, who teaches seventh grade English in Pennsylvania. And Brooke, today we want to talk about flexible seating in middle school, the research behind it, and also the changing teaching methods. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Why did you start getting into flexible seating in middle school? And did it cost you a fortune to implement? That's a really good question. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Vicki. I started this journey two years ago when I was noticing that whenever I allowed my students the opportunity to not be in their traditional desks, that they would opt to be anywhere except in their traditional desks. So they were on the counter that's in my classroom. They were on the floor. They would find any place except being in the desk that they typically sit in for seven hours a day. So that was really what kind of got the gears going with thinking about, I wonder if I need to take a look at my classroom learning environment. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to pilot something within my school, within my classroom and not spend a fortune on it. And I wanted it to truly be student focused. And uh, the focus was really on teaching middle school students. And at that point, it hadn't really taken off yet in the secondary grades. And so it really takes knowing your students and approaching the learning environment in a different way and looking at how students are collaborating and, you know, items that we want them to be able to do when they become independent citizens by the time they graduate and things that their jobs will be requiring of them. So did you have to spend a fortune? I did not. My pilot year, I spent the whole summer transitioning my classroom and I decided that I would spend a little bit out of pocket. My goal was $200 and I tried to limit myself to that. And that included writing a lot of grants, talking to a lot of local businesses and asking for donations. And also you utilizing some materials that were within my building, but were in storage, um, tables and things of that nature as part of the pilot program for my classroom. So uh, I am walking into your room. Describe for me what I'm going to see. Well, I have a variety of different levels of seating in my classroom, and I have a very traditional size classroom. I would say with the desks, traditional desks that fit 25 comfortably, I could fit 30 desks. So when I took the 30 traditional desks out of my classroom, I found that I wanted to appeal to a variety of learners with different levels of seating. That's what the research taught me. So I was able to acquire a few high top desks with rolling chairs that were in use in a large group instruction room. My principal allowed me to borrow four of them for my pilot. I also utilize the counter space and I can fit several students up there for either standing or if they want to even sit up on the counter, they can utilize that. So I consider that the standing seating or even just the high top seating. I also have four regular height tables with chairs that we were moving chairs out of our cafeteria and replacing them with newer chairs. So I was able to acquire some of those from the building. I made bucket seats for one of the tables. And so I was able to just use padding and some fabric material for those. I also have four Adirondack chairs, the plastic Adirondack chairs. So I have students that really enjoy those. I also have several varieties of floor seating. I was able to have tires donated from a local tire company and spray paint donated from a local hardware store. And I was able to make tire seats for relatively inexpensive amount of money. And I have some padded backings that go on those. I was able to write some grants over the course of the last two years for some beanbag chairs. I have a table on the floor with some padded floor seats. And just recently, I was able to get some chairs that kind of fold up. I don't remember exactly what they're called, but they can expand or fold up. So they're able to sit on the floor independently, but they can move the backs of those chairs. And I also have a video rocker for students that require a little more movement. A tire seat? Is that something that like has a cushion in the middle or describe it? It does. Yeah. So it's just a tire that's turned on its side. I did put some pillows in the middle. And this is one of the differences between elementary classrooms and secondary classrooms is in elementary, teachers make these tire seats. They have a wooden round that then you pad and you can cover in fabric or vinyl or whatever you prefer and kind of staple gun that to the back. I found that when I tested the tire seats without anything in the middle, I snapped the board. And in secondary, many of my students are about the same size as adults. So I figured that I needed to put something in the middle to work as a shock absorber 
absorber. So I just have pillows in the middle and then I have these wooden padded rounds on the top of the tire seats and the kids really gravitate towards them. Okay. So I was just going to ask, which are the favorite seats, the ones that the kids kind of run to class and get? I do pull the students each marking period in all five of my classes and they have shown me that it really is very individualized what they prefer. I have many students that really prefer to be in one of the floor level seats. They want to be on the tire seat. They want to be in a beanbag chair. And it's not difficult for them to accomplish what task is needed. I have other students that gravitate towards the traditional seats and really just feel like they want that table space. They want that working space. And also in the Adirondack chairs, they're a favorite as well. The high top tables, I think, are definitely a favorite. And I only have four of them with the rolling chairs. And I find my students that need Need a little bit of movement, they gravitate towards those because they can roll those chairs just ever so slightly. So it's not distracting to anyone, but they're able to get a little bit of that movement in. So how does this impact behavior? Well, I would say before I made the transition of flexible seating, I had very strong classroom management and I still believe that I do. I don't have behavior issues in my classroom. And that was my biggest concern for the first day of school. Once I moved all the traditional desks out of my room, I thought, oh my, is this going to be chaos? And that's not something that I wanted to sign up for. So that's where my background with teaching middle school for those 13 years before making this transition really came into play because I felt like I had a very strong handle on how much to allow students to do, what movement would benefit them, what things would be distracting to their peers sitting near them, and really have a strong handle on it. So what I found is that I had even fewer behavior issues than before, which was almost non-existent, but I found some added benefits for my emotional support students, students that maybe would have needed to take a break out of my classroom for whatever reason, they were no longer requiring those breaks, which was an added benefit that I did not foresee prior to this experiment. How has it changed your teaching approach? I was looking at what my vision was for my classroom and how that would, of course, change my teaching because flexible seating is about so much more than the seats in the room. So I wanted my students to be able to collaborate and be able to work with them one-on-one. I've incorporated blended learning models and I've incorporated that collaborative piece where I can really move around the room and work with them in small groups, things of that nature. I found previously that even when I put the traditional desks in small groups, that really the students we're finding that the desks were kind of getting in the way. And that's when they started asking me, can we work over at the counter or can we move to the floor in front of the door? Just because they were able to have that comfort level and be able to collaborate at a much better rate than previously. So if I came in your room and I said, I'm taking all these out and I'm going to make you use desks, how would you feel? Well, I would feel that that would not be as beneficial since I had 13 years with the traditional desks. I feel that because it's not just about the seats, it's about the student buy-in. It's about allowing students to have that voice and that choice about where they're going to learn best and allowing them to have a little bit more priority with where they're going to be learning best for that class period. So giving them that choice, I think, has been a key, especially with middle level students. I found that it's really prioritizing their needs and allowing them to find their own niche where they're going to be able to learn best. And that's heightened their collaborative learning, creating that buy-in, utilizing their that student voice has been key for my classroom. Brooke, you train new teachers and you also work with the standards in your state in evaluating language arts teachers. When people come in to evaluate you, Do you get an odd response? Do they know what to think about your room? The response that I've gotten from fellow educators is that the students are, whether they're collaborating or even if they're working independently on something, having the choice of where they would like to sit and how they would like to best accomplish whatever task I've put in front of them has really increased the level of concentration that they're able to have and maintain throughout the class period. I have seen an increase in their output and Anytime I see a student struggling with the seat that they've chosen, then I'm quick to have a discussion with them about that and talk about, is it the peers that you're near that maybe we should separate from, or is it the seat itself? Should we try something new? And so I'm able to work out things pretty quickly. So talk to teachers who are ready to get started and give them a 30 second pep talk about how to implement flexible seating. So I started right away with my students talking to them about how they needed to pick a seat that was going to work best for them. 
And if it wasn't working best, then I would be moving them. And students want the choice. They don't want that choice taken away. And so they're going to produce more and better quality. I definitely would encourage teachers who are looking to implement flexible seating to talk to their building administrators, make sure that administration is on board with anything that they want to pilot. There's regulations in some states, so make sure that everything that you have meets fire code for your state. I do give my students a survey every marking period and they give me their top choices and then I sort them into what's called a home base seat, which is basically their assigned seat when they come in. It makes attendance easy for me. It makes it so that my room is easy for substitutes to run when I'm not here and the students have their place that is theirs. Fantastic ideas. So teachers, if your kids hate their desks, why don't you think about doing something about it? These are some great options from Brooke Markle. Thanks, Brooke. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the 10-Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.